Hi, and welcome to my talk. We're going to talk about how to embed Python in Go with almost no serialization and very little memory. My name is Miki Tebeka. I work and own 353 Solutions, where we do some consulting and a lot of training in both Python, Go, and the scientific Python stack. I've been working with Python for about 24 years and Go from the very beginning, 11 years. And I'm also one of the organizers of GopherCon Israel and the Go Israel Meetup, and I used to organize the PyCon Israel Meetup. So the question is, why? Why do we want to use both Go and Python in the same project? We have Go, it's a great language, there's a lot of libraries, so why should we use another language in it? And as Scotty says, use the right tool for the right job. Go is great at high concurrency at server's API endpoint. But when it comes to data science, Go is years away from Python. Yes, we have GoNum and friends, but it's not the same. The Python ecosystem is much, much richer. And chances are your data science team is working in Python. Converting code from Python back to Go will take time. And it's also a risky operation. So why not enjoy both worlds, rewrite and do the heavy lifting in Go and use Python for the data science stuff. The question is then, why not RPC? Start a Python server on HTTP or gRPC and then call it from Go. And this is an awesome solution. If you can do that, by all means, go that path. It's much easier, uh, it's much more structured and you will have way less errors when you do that. But sometimes you have very strict performance requirements. And in these cases, we need to think about something else. Every time you do an RPC call, these RPC calls mean that you need to do serialization and network call, and then dish serialization on the other side, do some work, and then to send back the data, the result, you need to do again serialization, another network call, and another deserialization. And this takes time. So if you can eliminate that, this can save us a lot of time and the time spent will be only on the actual work and not the communication. So how are we going to do it? We're going to glue C, we're going to use C as a glue between Python and Go. And we have on the Go side, we have C Go, which we all know. And Python, the Python that we are using is called C Python because it's Python implemented in C. There are other Pythons as well, right? There is Jython, which is Python written in Java. There is PyPy, which is Python written in Python, and a lot of times it's faster than C Python, and several other ones. The C Python has an extensive C API. Most of the time people use the C API to write extension to Python. You identify that some code is too slow in Python, you rewrite this code in C using the Python C API, and then you can import it and use it as a regular Python model. But the C API can let lets you also work on the other direction. You can import Python or embed Python inside an application. And I've done it several times, and it's a great way of adding scripting and dynamic features to your program. And this is what we're going to do. To avoid serialization, we are going to look at some preconditions that help us. We have code that is you're going to use NumPy uh, to do outlier detection. And what is going to help us is that both the Go Float64 and NumPy's Float64 have the same representation memory. They use the same representation of a floating point number. The second thing is that both NumPy arrays and Go slices are continuous in memory. We don't have gaps, so we can pass them around in the underlying representation memory the same way. So let's have a look. First, let's look at the setup. So here is an example code, what we're going to do. We'll start by creating a new outlier object, which uses the code from the outlier Python module and the function detect inside it. And we're going to defer the closing of 
this object and we'll talk about why. Then we're going to get some data, pass it along to the detect method and get back the indices of the outliers, if there are any. And finally, we're going to print them out. If you're going to look at the Python code, it's very short. We calculate the z-score for every element in the array that's coming in, find out where the elements are more than three, uh, have a z-score of three and bigger, uh, bigger than three, and then we're going to return these indices. So this is the example code, this is the Python code, and the Go code that we want to run. So in outliers, we start with the new function. So the new function first calls initialize to initialize Python and NumPy. And then it is going to call load pyfunc, which is loading a Python function and saving it as a Go a variable. And then we're going to return this outliers. And you can see here that fn is the field that is a Python object. Everything in C Python, including functions, is something called a pointer to a Py object. So what does initialize do? Initialize is going to use async at once to make sure that we initialize only once. It is going to call the C function for initialized in Python and get the error if we have it. And in Grudo C, init Python is calling py initialize, which initializes Python, and then import array, which is initializing NumPy. The second thing we saw in outliers.go is that we loaded the Python function. When we load the Python function, we need to convert the Go strings to C strings and right away make sure that we free these C strings. And then we call the C function from our glue code to load this function and return the function at the end. So here's the load function. It gets a model name and a function name. We convert the name from C string to Python string. And the same we do for the function name. Sorry. And we call the py import import to import the model. If we cannot import the model, we return null. Returning null in Python indicates an error that there was some kind of an exception. And then we do get utter string to get the function from the model, do a decref. Decref means uh, decrements the referent counter. Python memory management is a referencing counting, meaning every time you get an object or create an object, it has a reference counter that is increased by one. And when you're done with it, you should decrease the reference counter. And this, uh, using two system that each one has its own way of managing memory, this is the most difficult part when you're dealing with these kind of things. And then we return the function. Right, and now we're all set. So we initialize Python, initialize NumPy, we loaded the module and we got the pointer to the function. Now uh, we're going to have a look at what happens when we call the detect function all the way from Go up to the Python code, down to the Python code. So what are we going to do is we're going to make sure that everything is using the same memory. So we're going to take the slice, the Go, the Py, the Go slice, and we're going to pass it uh, to C just as the address of the underlying array. And then from in the C code, we're going to create a NumPy array that points, looks at the same memory location where the underlying array of the slice is looking to. Okay, so here is our detect function. We convert the float64 slice to a C double array by taking the address of the first element of the slice and casting it to a C double. 
and then we call the detect function from the glue C code with our function pointer, the, the pointer to the Python function that we, we have from the, from the new, the array, and how many elements are there in the array. In the glue code, uh, what we need to do is take this double array of values and convert it to a NumPy array. We tell the NumPy what are the dimensions of the array, and we call the Py array simple new from data, which tells it create a NumPy array looking at these values in memory. It is not going to copy them. Then we need to construct the function argument. In Python, uh, in the C API, function arguments are passed as a tuple, which is like a, a slice, but um, immutable. You cannot change it. And here we create a new one and set the first item to our um, to the array. And then we do Python object call object to the function that we have. This is passed on line 33 and these arguments that we just constructed. Right, and this is going to be uh, basically calling the function detect with data, which is an NumPy array. And now, how do we get the data back to Go? So what we're going to do here uh, is we're going to do the same, th the same thing. We're going to get the underlying memory from the NumPy array we're going to pass it back to Go. And now there is a desi design decision. Do we want to keep using the data from the NumPy array? But then we need to make sure that once we're done with the NumPy array, somehow we're going to free this memory by calling decref, or, and this is the approach I took, is saying most of the time the number of outliers is small. It's not going to be as big as the array. And this method of keeping the NumPy memory is pretty complicated and will make the code complicated. So I'm going to copy over the code from Python to a new slice managed by the Go memory and then free the Python. And this makes the, it much easier because now I can just return a slice and move on with Go as it is without um, needing to think about uh, freeing and finalizers and many other things that might or might not work as expected. So let's have a look. So in the glue.c we have a result object, right? So this result object is the NumPy array, the indices, which is uh, basically an array of uh, longs, how many indices we found, and an indicator, an integer, whether there was an error or not. So we set the object to the NumPy array, and we convert it to a NumPy object, to a, sorry, to a Python object. Right, it was a Py array object, if you can see it on line 48, and now we convert it to Python object. And this is okay because Py array objects start with the Python object and then have some extra uh, fields on it. We set the size, and this is calling, again, a NumPy function, NumPy C API function called Py array size. And then the indices, we get the underlying memory, again, using PyArray.getPTR, getting the pointer to the memory and returning the results. Okay, so now in detect, uh, we got the data. We got the result and we're checking if there is a result, uh, we're going to return an error. Otherwise, we're going to convert the C long pointer to a slice. And we're going to do it by a trick of fooling the Go compiler. So we set a max size for the return value, which is one gigabyte. And if the size that we get is more than one gigabyte, uh, we contain an error. And then we get an unsafe pointer to the C array, and then we cast it to look like it's an array of maximal size 
at that location in memory. This is not going to allocate a one gigabyte memory uh, in Go. It's just fooling the compiler to think that there is a one gigabyte um, array starting at that location. And now we create our own slice. This is the one that is going to be managed by Go. And we're going to copy to the slice the up to the size from the array that C returned or that Python returned. Okay, so now we have a slice which is managed by Go return, and return the slice, of course. So now we have a slice that is managed by Go. So now we can tell Python, we're done with what you did, we're done with the memory that you allocated, so we decrement uh, the reference counter for the NumPy array that was uh, the result of calling the detect function in the Python model and return the index. And now we have the data. Uh, for some bookkeeping, we also have a close, and we saw it before on the outliers object. And this one is calling pydecref on the function itself. So this function object also consumes memory, and uh, we can free it. So we have our code going all the way down and all the way up. We didn't do any serialization. We used the same underlying memory from here and from there, and this is because both NumPy and Go using the same representation in memory for a float or a, an integer. And we did very little memory, and this is the epsilon memory, when we decided that uh, to make the code simpler and easier to use uh, with memory management, we are going to copy the indices from uh, the memory managed by Python to the one memory managed by Go. What's left is building. We need to build this code. And to build this code, we need to help the C Go to find out things. So first, we're going to need to tell it where to find the Python handles, right? If you look at uh, glue.h, we see that we include python.h. So it needs to know uh, where it is. And what we're going to use is a Cgo directive. The Cgo directive for pkg config is calling the pkg config utility, uh, which uh, is found on most Linux systems and can tell you about where to find header files for various packages. Uh, it should tell you also about how to link with various packages, but for some reason it didn't do that. So I had to tell Cgo also to link with the Python library. So this is for the Python one, and this was pretty easy to get. The problem was the NumPy one. So in glue.c, uh, we have uh, include of the NumPy object, and we need to find where the NumPy objects and headers are. And I couldn't find them, I couldn't find a way to do it with pkg config or in a static way. The way to do it is to call Python or call and ask NumPy for a specific um, function that will tell you where NumPy is installed and where to find header files. So this is has to be dynamic and this is not something that is easy to do with the Go build system. So what I decided to do is do it outside of the build system. I'm using a make file and I'm calling Python and telling it to input NumPy and print the NumPy get include which tells us where are the include libraries and then when I'm running the code or building the code I'm using the cgo c flags dash i numpy include. And this is how I'm passing uh, dynamically the location of the numpy header files to the build system or the run system. Another thing I need to do is because I'm doing an import in Python, Python looking for um, model where to import models in something called the Python path. And I'm adding the current directory where the outliers.py is. Uh, to the Python path, so our test will work. And finally, we can run the tests. And we can see that they're passing. Okay, so what's left? What's left is, one, the thread safety, or the GoRoutine safety. Uh, Python has a global interpreter lock, and when you call it from in the C level, you need to make sure that you're on the same thread 
uh, calling Python. Uh, we can probably add a sync.mutex to our outliers and finish with this issue, but uh, maybe there are other things that uh, we need to be aware of. Maybe we need to lock to the OS thread. Uh, this is also an option. I would like to have better error recovery. What I'm doing right now is I'm getting the last error from Python and returning it as an error. But Python can also give you a stack trace and many other things. So maybe uh, I can utilize that to show better errors and maybe do better error recovery uh, in the future. Memory leaks. Every time you have two different systems, each one managing their own memory, um, this is an option. I think I got all of them, but I'm really not sure. So hopefully uh, I'm getting them right. So thank you for listening so far. Uh, there is a blog post and this talk is based on this blog post on the Arden Labs blog. And then later on, Chris took it and made an excellent uh, extended blog post on the subject of embedding Python in Go. I'd like to thank the folks on the Dark Arts uh, channel on the Gopher Slack. They helped me a lot in the design and understanding some of the edge cases. And you can find all the code and these slides on GitHub repo for my talks. That's it. Thank you. And now it's time for questions.